Hello, my name is Christian Barton. Today we're going to talk about knowledge translation in the digital age. So quick disclosures, um, I do teach courses related to running and knee injury management. I treat patients with education and exercise. I was dragged kicking and screaming to social media, despite now being the deputy editor for social media at the British Journal of Sports Medicine. And also I'm involved with some not-for-profit initiatives related to knowledge translation, including GLAD, which I spoke about earlier this week, and also Trek, which I'll speak a little bit about today. Okay, so before I go further, I just want to say a big thank you to Professor Kay Crosley and Professor Karam Khan, who helped bring me into this space and encouraged me to explore it. And also I'd like to say a big thank you to Dr. Janilo de Oliveira Silva, and Dr. Mark Merrily, who have also supported some of the work we've done in this space, alongside a lot of other really clever and great uh, collaborators and PhD students. So why did I get pulled into this area? We'll, we'll talk about that a little bit. I'll also talk a little bit about the looming cliff for academic journals. We'll talk about the importance of embracing digital and social media innovation. And then importantly, can digital and social media facilitate research impact? And we'll cover some of that today. So my background is in patellofemoral pain research, and if we look at publications, like all areas, they're growing exponentially. I've only graphed this till 2016, and this was around the time that we published what we termed as the best practice guide. So very similar to a clinical practice guideline. And the reason I did this was I was frustrated in my clinical setting about the lack of translation into clinical practice of research findings. So we provided the guide only to discover that despite being open access, that very few people actually read it, and therefore, we still have this problem of a guideline or evidence practice guide, particularly related to exercise for chronic persistent musculoskeletal conditions. So if we look at uh, what happens and some qualitative work from patients with the condition of patellofemoral pain, which is a very common persistent knee pain condition of younger adults, we have statements like this. When I did get the physiotherapy, it kind of didn't really do anything. She did say, your knees will feel sore, but it went back to how it was anyway. So it just seemed like a pointless process. When I started with the physio at work, he told me that I shouldn't walk or I shouldn't swim because he just wanted to obviously manipulate it and get me pain free for, before I did anything. That couldn't possibly aggravate it. So you see a little picture of someone with their head in their hand above, and this was a, a key patient of mine that I saw that really spurred me to get involved, who received a lot of low value care. You can look this up a thousand cuts. Um, his name's Reese Donnan. He ended up having not just low quality physio, but also 11 surgeries um, as a result of his, his patellofemoral pain condition. So alongside my clinical practice and seeing patients who perhaps received care that I would deem not appropriate for them, I also become very frustrated by lots of things I'd report that they'd sought care online and using Dr. Google, etc. So we explored this, led by Danilo, who I mentioned before, and looked at it in the patellofemoral pain, uh, I guess, category. And we identified the top 20 uh, sites from Google and from Bing. And then we've had a look to see how accurate things were. So when we look at this, there's really poor accuracy of uh, types of information, particularly related to treatments that we know are effective for this condition, including hip and knee exercise, taping bracing, and also foot orthoses. Importantly though, 45% of websites out there were created to advertise products or services, and also 22% were actually recommending knee surgery, and in particular things like arthroscopy, which we don't see to, or don't seem to see being evidence-based for this population. So I was quite frustrated um, with my research, frustrated with clinical practice, and wondering what we can do and what we need to consider to try and change things. Then I started to think about the bigger picture. And of course we have the individual, but they're influenced by their social network, and in particular things like digital and social media, and then also influenced by cultural norms and a whole range of other things, including policy and funding. Mm -hmm. So I started to reflect as part of a communications masters I did on the current journal model and what we all work in. And if we summarize that in brief, we complete our research, we develop a question and design, we do the research, we analyze the results, we write up our manuscript, submit it to a journal, go through a sometimes quite lengthy peer review process, we address any concerns that come out of that, and then we finalize the paper and we sign it over to copyright. 
And I reflected on how this might match up to what is the newspaper model. And the academic journal model is 350 years old. And if we look at the newspaper, what we actually saw around about the 2010 mark, so we saw this dramatic drop off in revenue from the print media. And the reason was we had this great digital innovation where internet was suddenly fast, we had all these social media channels emerging, the ability to put video online and platforms like YouTube, etc. So people started to turn to alternate sources for information. And I think this happens in clinical practice as well. So we sort of started to summarise from qualitative work, talking to physiotherapists in particular about why they don't implement um, guideline and evidence into practice. Key barriers coming up in those conversations and qualitative work being article access, not being able to comprehend what was in articles, uh, lack of reader engagement, and also time to consume heavy format of text. So things like videos of exercise or treatment techniques, non-existent, um, and having to read through a whole scroll of information to try and understand what they should implement in their practice. So along with Mark Merrily, we wrote a paper um, related to these problems and the need for embracing digital innovation. And this was a quote I got back from an editor. So I enjoyed reading your article, although reading the abstract as a journal editor, I couldn't help thinking that saying I would be keen to publish it would be like the turkey voting for a hot Christmas dinner. So this was one of my favourites. So we actually bounced this around to a number of journals before we finally got it published, which highlights that maybe journals are not going to be the people who are going to change this landscape. What's important to note is that journals are a $35 billion plus industry and they make a profit margin of between 30 to 40% typically. So this is a big problem. So if we have a look at physiotherapists, I've done a lot of work in this space about what they prefer to learn from. And when we look at it, what's really important is there's huge diversity. Workshops, which I've talked about uh, earlier in the week a little bit, um, with the, especially with the student group, are a key way that we need to change practice. But original articles, although many people might suggest that they would use them to change practice, often they don't because they don't read them. And then we have a whole other range of sources that they engage with, things like podcasts, webinars, animated videos, infographics, blogs. And what you'll notice is that actually the people who typically write those are not the people who are doing the research and this creates sometimes an evidence practice gap in that not the right information or most appropriate information is always translated. So as a researcher we have this conflict and just to give you an indication of this I started playing around with all this work around 2015, 2016 doing my communications masters and you'll see my publication and uh, starting to drop off a cliff a little bit as well um, and I started to think well what can I do in order to try and improve things and I guess the problem we have is that we also have to get traditional publications so how can we find the time and how can we prioritize getting involved with social media and doing podcasts and webinars and those types of things. Um, luckily enough I've been able to marry some of the work that I do with also traditional publications and I also work within a team and we try and support each other to do the knowledge translation alongside traditional work and we can maybe chat about that more in question and answer but being able to get my number of publications back up again. So our paper we published was titled It's Time to Replace Publish or Perish with Get Visible or Vanish. I encourage you to have a read of this if you've got some interest in the space. Um, and essentially what we looked at doing is creating a model which is actually now being expanded upon. So creating the research, publishing the research, and then the idea then is we create communication assets beyond the research paper. And then we need a dissemination plan or a, or a communications plan to get that information out there. And then of course it's a good idea because we're researchers to evaluate the reach and impact of the research. So the things we discussed in the paper, the opportunities that we're maybe missing as researchers is to embrace social and mainstream media, embrace different re uh, written formats, podcasts, visually, visually engaging summaries and video. So as a communications plan, you might write a media release, you might also write a blog, you might record a podcast, reach out to people who do them, and you might also uh, develop some infographics. And then you've got a good communications set of assets, and then we try and disseminate it widely from there. So to give you some examples of using this process, uh, Dr. Andrew Murray, who's a researcher in Scotland, took on this concept that we put and he actually applied it to a paper of his about the relationships between golf and health. And this was a scoping review. 
And in short, this, the conclusion was golf can provide uh, moderate intensity physical activity, and this is associated with physical health benefits. Um, so they created a video, a podcast, an infographic series to disseminate this information. Um, they targeted the consumer, so people who play golf. They targeted the industry, so golf clubs, um, golfing facilities. And they also targeted policy and decision makers, which was quite unique. Had infographics targeted to all these different people. And they sent out lots of emails, also lots of media releases, a whole range of different things. So after quite a complex dissemination process, what were the results? Well, they got a malt metrics of 1411. I think it's a little bit higher now. This meant for 87 news outlets, um, also picked up on Twitter as one of the key social media channels. And importantly, this was actually discussed, this paper, in UK Parliament. So a really comprehensive and well thought out communication strategy was really quite effective for this research group to get information out there related to their paper. So I've applied this to many of my own papers, and I think last count I had over 35 papers with alt metrics above 100. Um, and I think the important thing about this is it's making sure that what we're doing as a research group is reaching many, many people. As an example of this, a clinical practice guideline, remembering that I was trying to get patellofemoral pain information to many people earlier, um, we put it together some infographics and podcasts and media releases, etc. And we were able to, based on that, get our altmetrics up to close to 800. And this has led to uh, this particular guideline in the Journal of Orthopedic and Sports Physical Therapy being downloaded more than 140,000 times, which is actually the most downloaded paper of all time in the journal um, and certainly has the highest altmetrics for the journal as well. So it just shows you that if you put a little bit of time and effort in, you can get your information out there. Um, so does digital and social media increase research impact? So if we talk about research impact, this being that you're actually getting researchers to talk about and, and use your work. So uh, led by Danilo, who I mentioned earlier, we looked at the top 20 journals um, with the highest impacts in sports sciences. And what we did is we extracted data related to number of citations, but also whether it was open ac access and altmetric scores. So impact factor when we looked at that and its relationship with whether or not the article was cited or how often it was cited we had a R squared of 0.14 so there seems to be some relationship between the journal's impact factor and how much your work might get cited what we found really interesting was that the open access status of that paper was not related and we might be able to chat more about that in the Q&A but the strongest relationship was with altmetric score so we had an R squared of 0.32 where the higher the altmetric score the more citations you're likely to get in the next couple of years. So when we break that down a little bit further, most of this seemed to be driven by Twitter, but certainly was influenced by news outlets, blog posts, um, Facebook, um, and also considerations for a range of other things. So this is an important thing for us as researchers that perhaps some time and effort on trying to disseminate via digital and social media might lead to our work being cited more. Now this is not a cause and effect study, so that's an important consideration, it's cross-sectional, but there certainly does seem to be a relationship. So the other thing I've worked a lot with in the past few years based on uh, learnings and understanding from my comms degree is controlled media. So we have a blog set up at La Trobe Sport and Exercise Medicine Research Centre just as a context for trying to reach people with kneecap pain or patellofemoral pain. I have a five tips web page which has had well over 200,000 views and actually it now gets around 15 to 20,000 views every month. And on that is a whole range of videos and tips for people with kneecap pain. So hopefully we can reduce the number of cases like Reese that I sometimes see. Um, we also put Reese's story up online. So this was his story of ending up having 11 surgeries after not really seeing appropriate care provided to him. This controlled media was actually picked up by uncontrolled media as well and SBS Insight picked up his story um, and as I said I encourage you to watch that online. The good news about Reese is once he did get access to appropriate care he got his quality of life back and this is him walking the Inca Trail, Inca Trail a couple of years ago before we ended up being locked down with a pandemic. Um, 
and for myself as a researcher, uh, as a result of that work with SBS Insight, I was actually there not invited onto the show to talk about uh, exercise and osteoarthritis, so another topic I've talked about during this uh, conference. So just to summarise some last things that we've done in this space, we've also developed resources for people with kneecap pain and this is a freely available website called mykneecap.trekeducation.org. We have a whole range of information in multimedia resources, so infographics, podcasts, etc. And we have an exercise program set up on there. Um, We have a look at some of the results and this is in an open access paper so using that digital and social media approach to get information out what we saw in a small study where we uh, provided the website to people over a six-week period is actually around about 42% um, were completely recovered or markedly better and actually 84% of this population were at least moderately better at our six-week follow-up which actually seems to align with what we see in clinical trials of providing this type of care in a face-to-face -face sense. So we have some more work to do in this space and try to develop the resource further to be used both with and without uh, health professionals but certainly seems to be promising when we use it and hopefully replace some of the low-value information that already exists online. So a few take homes, we are inherently poor at communicating research and that's probably because we don't really have the incentives. Hopefully I've given you a bit of inspiration incentive to get involved today. Uh, we all need to embrace digital innovation if we are to improve things. And this doesn't mean that you need to do the work, but you need to have people within your team. Multimedia and online resources are powerful. Um, and knowledge translation is certainly not simple. Um, so even though we might talk about this today in today's session, there's so many other factors that dictate what healthcare people seek and what healthcare people are provided. For example, um, public policy and public and private system funding. But I want to say a big thank you for you attending today and I look forward to question and answer. Um, you'll see the Trek Education website there and the My Kneecap site, which I've mentioned. And I strongly encourage you to follow Danilo, who's done a ton of great work in this space. And I look forward to speaking to you all soon.